So he's confessing the seeming absurdity here of ultimately blinding somebody and then holding them accountable for their blindness. Today, we're going to be talking about the book Providence by John Piper. It just came in and I've been reading it recently. I'm a theology nerd. Yes, I even read 700 page books by people I don't agree with. Uh, and uh, I, I told you guys I would be doing this. And he is giving us all kinds of great information for us to go through. I got to page about 175 over the last couple of days. And that's where it just came full stop. And you're going to see why as we go through this, why it came full stop. <laughs> Whenever I read uh, on page 175, something that John Piper said, that seems at least to me, completely inconsistent with what I've heard him say elsewhere, uh, which is not unusual when it comes to dealing with Calvinism. Calvinism is a systematic by which there depends upon in some ways, quandaries of seemingly inconsistent concepts and ideas. Uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly mean to our Calvinistic friends. All of us have mysteries within our particular worldviews, but I think mysteries are quite a bit different than blatant contradictions. And as we've argued before, I think there are some blatant contradictions inherent within the determinism of Calvinism. And those are the things we're trying to push back on. Okay. So this is where I came full stop uh, here on page 175 of the book Providence. And the reason I came full stop here is because he starts, like I said, buttering the bread on the provisionist table. Uh, meaning he's using our terminology as if it's his terminology and thinking that we won't notice or that maybe we won't care or maybe that others won't notice. I don't know. I, I'm not sure exactly why some Calvinists think they can get away with this, but we're going to point out what we feel, at least, or what we see as the logical inconsistencies here of these kinds of statements. Um, listen to what he says. He says, if God planned the suffering of his son before creation and thus before the sin of Adam and Eve, as we saw in Revelation 13:8 and 2 Timothy 1.9, then he foresaw the coming of sin and planned to permit. What does that mean? Planned to permit it to enter the world. I choose those words carefully. So this is not a mistake he's made, okay? He's not misspeaking here. He is choosing these words carefully. Planned to permit. Sometimes we say God permitted something. This is perfectly fitting since God's providence does not govern all events in precisely the same way. Permission is one way to describe some of his acts of providence. For example, let us go on to maturity, and this we will do if God permits out of Hebrews chapter 6. So he is using passages, which we agree. We, we use the word permission all the time. Uh, continuing on down the second, the next page, this is 176, obviously in his book, but what he sometimes, what, what, what we sometimes overlook is that since God foresees what he may or may not permit, he chooses whether to permit or not. Now let's just think about this logically. Okay. Let's think about this logically and in accordance with the other claims of the Calvinistic worldview. All right. So if God is foreseeing what he will permit, what is it he's permitting, if not his own decree? He has to be permitting what? The free will choice of creatures or his decree? Which one? This, this is the problem. When you have a worldview that says God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, then what is it that God is permitting and or restraining? We'll hear Calvinists all the time talk about God permits this, restrains that, okay? What is it he's permitting and or restraining if not his own decree? If you say permission or if you say he's restraining something, it is presuming libertarian freedom of the will because that is what he's permitting and or restraining. He's restraining Satan who is acting independently of himself, of, of God. He's restraining Satan from doing what Satan wants to do freely. He's restraining Jonah from going to Tarsus. He's restraining uh, Abimelech from sleeping with Sarah. Okay, he's restraining that from happening. Why? Because he decreed them to do it and only to step in and restrain them from doing what he decreed for them to do? Okay, so in other words, if you use the vocabulary of provisionists, Arminians, non-Calvinists of all sorts, and you're making statements like God permits this thing to happen, 
then you seem to be presuming that he's permitting something outside of himself. Otherwise, you've got him permitting himself. And that makes no rational sense at all. It's just cloaking determinism with different words. And that's what we're calling out. Now, this is not just my argument, okay? You're going to hear from John Calvin himself making the exact same argument against free willers, okay? And so John Calvin is going to bring a rebuke of this kind of language. We'll get there, but let's go on through. Let, let's hear out. Remember, uh, I know I'm accused of not representing Calvinists correctly and all those kinds of things, but who is going through their words, putting them on the screen for you, letting them come on the program. John Piper has an open invitation as John, as does James White and other leading Calvinists I have open invitation on my program. Anytime you want, just let us know um, who, what Calvinist is doing that for us. Okay. Not many leading Calvinists are at all, or none of the leading Calvinists and not many of the lower level. Nobody knows Calvinists and not try to be mean to those. I'm, I'm one of those people on my, my side too, but very few are representing us with our own words. And, and so I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to represent, let them represent themselves with their own words. So here we go. Okay. So he says, and all God's choices accord with his perfect wisdom and goodness and justice. God is not whimsical. He never chooses foolishly or sinfully, which of course we would agree with that. Matter of fact, this whole paragraph I would agree with, okay, because he's using, again, he's buttering the bread on our table here. Uh, as, as one, <laughs> I love that blog, by the way, that, uh, uh, Peter uh, writes. So he says, uh, he chooses in view of all the consequences, painful and pleasant that will flow from whatever he permits. Therefore we may speak properly of what he plans to permit. So what he planned to permit, again, we see that same terminology, what he planned to permit. But again, what is he permitting if not free will? His own decree? Is he planning? Is he is he decreeing something and then planning to permit what he decreed? What, what do you mean by that? And again, that's not my it's not my argument against this as much as it is even John Calvin's argument. Okay. And thus we may and should speak of God purpose, God's purpose in permitting. Now, that's our language again. We would love to talk about God's purpose in permitting. That's what free will is all about. What is God's purpose in, quote unquote, allowing for free creatures to act freely, i.e. allowing, permitting, right? That's a free will theodicy that you hear from all of the leading non-Calvinist out there. Every non-Calvinistic apologist out there that I'm aware of uses the free will theodicy of what true love and relationship looks like. The C.S. Lewis video that we've played dozens of times, we, this is, this is it. We, God has a purpose in permitting. God has a purpose in allowing for free choice. And we talk about that purpose that it's, it's necessary for true love and relationship, right? So what is the Calvinistic purpose in permitting? Well, let's continue down this page here and continue to understand what Piper is trying to argue. He goes on the next title says God planned permission of the fall. Okay. God foresaw Let's just think about this word for Saul right here. Does the word for Saul mean that he sees something that Adam and Eve freely choose to do and then permits them to freely choose to do that thing? Not on Calvinism, not in even John Piper's form of Calvinism, according to other things we're going to listen to. It's going to be a long program. Stay tuned. Okay. Because we're going to listen to John Piper in his own words, say things that are contradictory to what he just wrote and published and put out there. Is, is he softening himself here? I, and I don't know. I mean, I'm you, you be the judge. I'm just putting out the information. You, you judge. Okay. Um, I report you decide as they say, right? So God foresaw that Adam and Eve would sin, would sin freely or would sin by decree would sin because God decreed that they would sin or that he foresaw that they would choose to sin freely and allowed it to happen. Wh which one do you mean by that? Because again, you're using our vocabulary and bring ruin on his creation. He took this reality into the counsel of his will, considered all its consequences and all its pur his purposes, and chose to permit their fall into sin. He did this in accord with his perfect wisdom, justice, and goodness. Since he could have chosen not to permit this first sin, he, or uh, this first sin, just as he chose not to permit Abimelech's sin, 
it was I who kept you from sinning against me from Genesis 26, which, which by the way, perfect example, but proof that God steps in time to prevent a sin from taking place, which would possibly thwart a bigger purpose and plan of redemption that he has through Sarah's life doesn't prove that God quote unquote deterministically brings about all sin. Okay. Um, and it, and it certainly doesn't prove that God in any way decrees Abimelech's sinful desires or Abraham's sin in that, that, uh, circumstance either passing him off as his sister and giving him over to the King, like a, a jerk would do. So, Anyway, we know that God has wise and just and good purposes in permitting it. Okay, again, I, I don't disagree with any of this. I could have wrote this in my book. Okay, I, I almost verbatim, I could have wrote this in my book. It would be consistent Arminian provisionistic theology as it's written so far. And this is why we're going full stop. What, how is this consistent with what you have claimed elsewhere, John Piper? And what your systematic claims with regard to God's decree of all things that come to pass, including the very thing that you say he's planning to permit. I, it's, it is baffling. If God, he goes on to say, if God had wise and just and good purposes in permitting the fall of Adam and Eve, we may speak of God's plan in permitting it. Now, remember yesterday when uh, Austin Fisher was on, we read several quotes directly from John Calvin which talk about that the fall happened because God decreed it to happen. Not that God just foresaw that it would happen, but that God planned and decreed it to happen. Okay. So again, planning, plan, planning to permit something seems to suggest free wills in play. That is, we may speak of God's planning or ordaining the fall in this sense by planning or ordaining. I simply mean that God could have chosen not to permit the fall. So, by planning or ordaining, he simply means that God could have chosen not to permit the fall. Okay? So, whenever you say God ordained that Leighton Flowers believed in Jesus Christ, do you mean the same thing? I, I mean, honestly, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure this out, okay? When you say plan and permit, John Piper, could God not plan to permit every lost sinner to accept or reject the gospel? Just like he planned to permit Adam and Eve to sin or not to sin in the garden. In other words, if you're going to say that God planned to permit Adam and Eve to sin or not to sin, why can't you equally say God planned to permit Joe to accept or reject the gospel? What's wrong with that vernacular? How is that not consistent with our theology and inconsistent with your theology? Because by planning and ordaining, you simply mean that God could have chosen not to permit the fall. It seems to me that by planning or ordaining, you could simply mean that God has chosen to permit a choice with regard to salvation or not. And it would be cons perfectly consistent with what we claim is libertarian free will, which you in other articles explicitly deny is even possible or biblical. Just, just pointing out the inconsistencies. You, you take it for what you will. He goes on, but in choosing to permit it for wise purposes, he thus planned and ordained it. He considered everything, millions of things, trillions of things, he would do with it and made it a part of his ultimate plan. This means that God plans and ordains that some things come to pass that he hates. Okay, again, this is perfectly consistent with provisionism. This is consistent with Molinistic type of theology as well, or philosophy as well with regard to how God may know something is coming, but he permits that thing that comes, even though he hates the thing that happens. Okay. Jeremiah 19, five, they kill their children, burn them to Malek. Um, and even open theist have, would have an issue with this because they even acknowledge that God has enough foresight to know what possible things the people will do. And it is certainly when they're carrying their kids and tying them up and about to throw them in that, that, that window of time, even if it's only five or 10 minutes, God could step in and stop them from doing that and does not stop them from doing that. So even open theists have the quandary. If open theists think they're getting away from the quandary of why God permits sin to happen or moral evil to happen, they're not. They're just kicking the can down the road, so to speak. It doesn't really answer the quandary because in time, God could step in and stop something from happening 
if he chose to do so. And so the, the, the free will theodicy, the, the problem of evil existing exists even among open theists, open theists aren't getting away from that. Okay. And so whenever he says these kinds of things, again, he's speaking our vocabulary, but it's doesn't, in, in at least my estimation, doesn't seem at all consistent with the claims he's made elsewhere. This mean that he goes on, he says, this means that God plans and ordains some things that he hates. He hates sin. It dishonors him. It destroys people. Yet he planned to permit sin to come into his perfect creation. Now, do you say the same thing with regard to the crucifixion of Jesus, that he just planned to permit it with Pharaoh? He just planned to permit it. Or do you say he sovereignly and unchangeably ordained, decreed, causally determined, saw to it that it would come to pass, like you've said elsewhere? Because if you're going to talk about him just planning to permit something, in other words, I plan to permit Judas to betray him, knowing Judas's sin and using it for my purposes, our vocabulary, great, it's good theology. But if you're if you're going to say, as you said elsewhere, that God doesn't only uh, doesn't only work out the the bad for His good redemptive purposes, but that He actually brings about the molestations, the rapes, the murders, the killings, all the things that He does. Again, we're going to we're gonna listen to Piper in his own words in a minute, but I, I'm just letting you see both sides here. He planned to permit sin to come into his perfect creation. Therefore, God's infinite wisdom and holiness is not sinful for him to plan that sin come to pass. There are, no doubt, countless wise and holy reasons God plans to permit sin. Again, he's got God permitting sin versus God sovereignly and unchangeably bringing it about, as he says elsewhere. But we have been drawn into these reflections by only one, namely that God's ultimate aim in creation and providence is to display the glory of his grace, especially in the suffering of Christ, echoing forever in all satisfying praises of the redeemed. That is the ultimate wise, just, and good purpose of God in planning to permit the fall. Adam and Eve meant it for evil. God meant it for good. In other words, though there are mysteries in how God wills that sin exists, Without himself sinning, we are given biblical guidance for how to think and talk about this. For example, we may fittingly speak of the sin of Adam and Eve with the words that Joseph spoke of, the sin of his brothers, who sold him into slavery. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Genesis 50, 20. It does not say God used it for good. It said God meant it for good. Okay, let's talk about that for example. God meant it for good. What does he mean for good? He means the selling of Joseph into slavery so that he can bring Joseph through Potiphar into the Pharaoh's second command so that he is able to influence Pharaoh in such a way as to prepare him for the famine. Okay. So he meant what the evil brothers did for good. And we talked about this with our debate with Chris Date. Proof that God means a single act of evil for a good purpose doesn't mean that he somehow decrees the evil intentions of the brothers themselves. In other words, the reason that the brothers are guilty because the evil intentions are their own evil intentions. Lust and pride are not from the Father, but from the world, as 1 John 2.16 says. And so when the, the, the brothers have pride and lust for money, they're prideful and they're, and they're they're jealous of Joseph and his the love he has for the father and they they have lust for the money that they had they could gain for selling him. That pride and lust is not from the father. God does not sovereign and unchangeably decree their pride and lust. He knows and uses their pride and their lust just like he knows and uses the pride of of uh, uh, Pilate or Judas or the lust of Judas for money. The greed he has, he knows it and uses it for his purpose which he means for good, i.e. The, the, the crucifixion of Christ. He means it for good. The selling of Joseph into slavery, he means that for a good purpose. There is nothing here which even remotely suggests that God decrees, i.e. causally determines, brings about the sinful pride and lust of the actors within any of those events. And that, again, is the fault line of the Calvinistic system. They take it too far. Determinism, theistic determinism goes too far because it ultimately puts back onto the table something that God should not be blamed for, i.e. the choice of evil creatures to act in evil ways. And that's what we are trying to highlight as not what is biblical. Um, 
It does not say God used it for good. It says that God meant it for good. The same word used for the sinful intentions of the brothers is meant for evil. They have one intention in the act. God has another intention in the act. Exactly. But their intention in the act, according to the claim of Calvinistic theology, is decreed by God. And that's the problem. If you say, hey, they're guilty for their intentions, and then you also say their intentions are sovereignly and unchangeably decreed, i.e. causally determined by God, who determines their nature in such a way and their circumstances in such a way that they could not have chosen to do otherwise, then you're ultimately putting the blame back onto God versus onto them because you're not just having God permit them to make this choice. You're having God sovereignly ordain the actual desire and choice itself. And again, that's what you've got to understand in order to understand why this is so blatantly inconsistent. All right. So moving on, let's look at what I referenced earlier from Calvin's Institutes. Okay. This is where John Calvin is going to bring a critique of what you just heard from John Piper. So we've got John Calvin critiquing at least the section we just read from the book called Providence by John Piper, who is defending Calvinism. Okay. So let's hear what the namesake of the system at least says, so you can at least hear both sides. Calvin writes, from other passages in which God is said to draw or bend Satan himself and all the reprobate to his will, and more difficult, a more difficult question arises. For the carnal mind can scarcely comprehend how, when acting by their means, he contracts no taint from their impurity. Now, again, sometimes translation gets a little difficult to understand what he's saying here. When he says by the, he contracts no taint from their impurity, in other words, what he's saying is, how God does this thing by which he brings the reprobate to do what he wills them to do without contracting taint. In other words, without being guilty. In other words, how is it that God is not guilty for causing them to do what they do? That's the mystery here that he's appealing to. All right. Nay, how in a common operation, he is exempt from all guilt and can justly condemn his own ministers. Hence a distinction. In other words, here's the problem. Here's the, here's the mystery how God can control these ministers of Satan and the reprobate to do what he wills them to do and not be guilty for what they do. Some people have tried to justify God by doing this thing that he's going on to describe. A distinction has been invented. Look what it says. Hence, a distinction has been invented between doing and permitting. So here's, here's, again, John Calvin is critiquing John Piper's approach by saying he's inventing something, a, a distinction between doing something and permitting something, right? Because to many, it seemed altogether inexplicable how Satan and all the wicked are so under the hand of the authority of God that he directs their malice to whatever end he pleases and employs their iniquities to execute his judgments, the modesty of those who are thus alarmed at the appearance of absurdity might perhaps be excused. They do not endeavor to vindicate the justice of God from every semblance of stigma by defending an untruth. It seems absurd. Okay, follow this. It seems absurd that man should be blinded by the will and command of God and yet be forthwith punished for his blindness. So he's confessing the seeming absurdity here of ultimately blinding somebody and then holding them accountable for their blindness. He he admits that's absurd. It sounds absurd. Hence, recourse is had to the evasion that this is done only by permission. So what, what what is he arguing here? He's saying some people try to get out of this quandary that's created by this statement right here, this, this seeming absurdity right here. Some people are trying to get at it by using the word permission. It's ultimately what he's arguing. And also by the will of God. He himself, however, openly declaring that he does this repudiates the evasion. In other words, so what, what is Calvin arguing? He is saying, well, you can't claim that he does it by permission. He permits it because the Bible argues that he does do these things. Of course, his interpretation we would find suspect, but what he's arguing is the Bible says he does this. He doesn't permit it. He does it. They've invented a distinction between doing and permitting. And it's obvious that he does it because the Bible says he does it. And therefore, they 
are not following the truth and the, the logic of scripture by just coming out and saying he does it. Now, we would argue that the passages that seem to come across saying that God does something that's evil are often figures of speech, atenemies and other things that we've talked about, like the White House put Iraq into shambles by pulling the troops out. In other words, by letting Iraq act the way Iraq people the Iraqi people chose to act and the criminals in Iraq chose to act doesn't literally mean Barack Obama or the people in the white house went over and started cutting off heads and burning down buildings. No, of course not. It means he removed his power, the strength of the United States forces so that, that Iraq could act freely, autonomously, separately, libertarianly freely from the will of the white house. Right. In the same way, they say the, I, the, that the White House put Iraq into shambles by removing its presence. So too, there are, are there are same figures of speech within the scripture by permitting, by pulling back his presence, by allowing people to act freely, he has put them into shambles. He has put his wrath upon them. That's another word for wrath is to allow people in the, the natural consequences of their sins will lead to destruction. And that's referred to as sometimes as God's wrath. So it sounds like an active thing God's doing when in reality, it's simply him removing his protection and his presence to allow um, the natural consequences of one's actions and sin. Moving on, look what he goes on to say, that men do nothing save the secret investigation of God. In other words, men do nothing save what secretly God instigated. That's, that's his words, not mine. So make sure people, oh, you're, you're, you're misrepresenting Calvinism. This is John Calvin. Okay. I think Calvin probably understands Calvinism. All right. Okay. Men do nothing save at the secret in instigation of God. So who instigates the something that we do? God instigates. So if a molester molests, if Satan does something evil, who instigates it? God does. In fact, according to Calvin, men do nothing except by the instigation of God and do not discuss and deliberate on anything but what he has previously decreed. So they don't even discuss or deliberate on anything but what he has already decreed with himself and brings to pass by his secret di direction. It is proved by numberless clear passages of scripture, he goes on to argue. And of course, I think it's because he's misinterpreting those, scrap, those passages in the way that I described with the autonomies and other such things. And so you can see, I hope, the distinction between the way in which Piper has made these arguments and the way John Calvin, the namesake for the systematic he's supposedly defending, has argued these points. Just pointing out this, 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 this distinction between doing and permitting. Now, interestingly enough, because we have critiqued John Piper over the years, we know other things that he's said about this subject. And so I have them in files. I have them there from previous shows and previous programs. So hopefully this coming through, but let's listen to the difference between doing and permitting with John Piper's own words and see if it's consistent with the book he just recently released. Let's see. God. from Exodus 3, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. Jesus is claiming to be God, and the basis of it is I know Judas is going to betray me. This is huge. So the same thing is true of Peter's denial. Jesus knows precisely who will deny him. He knows how many times he will deny him. He knows when in the morning he will deny him. Same thing with Judas. When, where, why? And he knew this about Judas from the beginning. We know that from, from John 6, 64. I knew from the... Okay, so notice that he's pointing out sinful things that people have done that he knew from the beginning. He knew beforehand. So he knew the sinful choices of Judas. He knew the sinful choices of Peter beforehand. So we're talking about him knowing sin. Now, does he say he planned to permit Judas to sin? Does he say he planned to permit Peter to sin? You listen. When he chose Judas, he knew what he would do. Now, here's the text that connects the prediction of God with the planning or the performing of God. Isaiah 46, 9, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me declaring now here, here's his foreknowledge, declaring the end from the beginning. So he declares it, he knows it, and then he goes on. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, 
my purpose will stand and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So now we get a window onto how God knows the future. He knows it because he plans it and does it. He He knows it because he plans it and does it. Here he's consistent with Calvin. He doesn't he doesn't invent the distinction between doing and permitting. He just comes right out and says he knows the future, i.e. he knows what Peter will do, he knows what Judas will do because he plans it and he does it. His words not mine. He knows it because he plans it and performs it. Jeremiah one twelve. the Lord said, I am watching over my word to perform it. God doesn't just predict. He does what he predicts or Ezekiel 12, 25. He does what he predicts. So if he predicts the sin of Peter, what is he saying? He does the sin of Peter. Again, I'm using his words for themselves. And it seems consistent with what we just read from John Calvin, his namesake. But does it seem consistent with his planning to permit? You tell me how that's consistent. For I am the Lord. I will speak the word. I will speak it and I will perform it. I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord God. In other words, God knows the future because he performs the future. He's God knows the future. So what's the future? Well, at one time, the future was Judas's betrayal, um, Peter's betrayal, every rape of every person, every molestation of every child, every horrible, heinous thing is in the future at some point. And therefore to say that God knows the future because he performed the future. Maybe, maybe when he sits down and writes, he's more careful with his words than he is whenever he's talking on a broadcast. I, I, I would I would think that whenever he's he's per, he's getting these broadcasts per, together because they're so short and succinct, I, and he has them outlined there. I mean, they're I, I would think he's careful with his words. I'm just I'm just not sure how that's consistent. Maybe somebody on the side chat, if you see a consistency here that I don't see, or maybe you can just come out as a Calvinist and go, yeah, you're right. Uh, Piper's not real consistent in these uh, these two things. Uh, then I'd be glad to hear it if if you can see the consistency, because I certainly don't. Listen. Never surprised because he's not surprised at his own work. Foreknowledge is no So his own work. He's not surprised at his own work. So he's not surprised by Judas's sin. He's not surprised by Peter's sin because he's not surprised by his own work. Why would he call sin God's work when if if it's true that God only permits sin? God only plans to permit sin. Again, inconsistent. Not an awareness of what the fates will make happen. Foreknowledge is not an awareness of what random chance is going to bring about. Foreknowledge is not an awareness of what ultimate human autonomy is going to produce. There okay, so foreknowledge is not what will be produced by human autonomy, is what he just now said. But yet, doesn't he foreknow what Adam and Eve will do? And they're, if they're not doing it autonomously, then why does he foreknow what they will do? Listen. There is no fate. There is no random chance. There is no ultimate human autonomy. What God knows is what God will do. The future is not some kind of freewheeling reality separate from God's will that he has to try to catch on to and adapt to. He knows the future because he plans the future, and he's never surprised by what he plans. Okay. And so the future at one point was Adam and Eve's sin. So how does he know what Adam and Eve does? Because he does it. He performs it, which is exactly what Calvin's Institute says, and exactly the opposite of what I just read in his book, Providence.